Hi everyone, uh, this is our fourth video on sex determination and in this one we're going to talk about the origins of genetic sex determination in different vertebrates. So here we're going to uh, talk about two concepts. Um, one is talking about how new mechanisms of genetic sex determination have evolved when new copies of core genes from the sex determination switch arise. And we'll talk about how that can either be new gene duplicates, that is totally new copies of the gene, or new mutants giving rise to new alleles. Um, and then we'll also talk uh, a little bit about how new sex-determining alleles can give rise to new sex chromosomes. Um, so I wanted to start with a little bit of a caveat here. Um, we're going to be talking about how X or Y systems can, or sorry, X, Y, or ZW systems can arise from environmental sex determination. Um, although, however, recent work has shown that it's possible for ZW and XY systems to evolve into each other or even certain XY systems to evolve into other XY systems. So this is from a really beautiful paper by um, Beatrice Vicoso and Doris Backtrog at uh, Berkeley. And what they're showing here is these different colors indicate that different chromosomes, different groups of genes have become new sex chromosomes in all these different lineages of flies. Right, so we're not taking into account quite all this complexity, but I still think uh, that our discussion will capture the most important parts of learning how to reason through complex questions like this. Okay, so perhaps the simplest one is the case in chicken. Um, so in chicken, the sex-determining gene DMRT1 uh, is on the Z chromosome. And so that would mean that in ZZ individuals, there are two alleles, each expressing uh, transcripts and proteins, uh, which then stim stimulate sex SOX9 and FGF9 and kick off the male circuit. So by contrast, there's no longer a functional DMRT1 copy on the W chromosome. There was a mutant, just like the one we discussed in the last video, which knocked out the DMRT1 chromosome, or so it, um, sorry, the DMRT1 gene, or so it's thought. So what that means now is that in this ZW chromosome pair, um, that we only have one copy expressing, uh, which it turns out is insufficient to stimulate SOX9 and FGF9, and we end up with the female regulatory program. Okay, so let's talk about the next one. Um, I'm going to put this slide to remind us uh, that we're talking about different instances of evolution. Right, so we just talked about birds over here, uh, and now we're going to talk about a lineage of fish um, that completely independently evolved sex determination, uh, uh, genetic sex determination. And I want to point that out because it's quite confusing if we forget that the alleles we were just talking about are not thought to occur in the, the population we're currently th talking about. Okay, so try to erase what we just talked from your mind about Z chromosomes and mutant DMRT1s. And let's proceed and talk about the case in Madaka. So again, Madaka is a Japanese killerfish, and the case in Madaka is that there's a Y-linked uh, a Y linked gene, DMY, on the Y chromosome that stimulates SOX production. So it turns out that the way that this evolved um, was that the DMRT1 gene duplicated from the chromosome where it initially was, uh, to another place. And so that meant that individuals that had this new gene copy would have two copies uh, at the original site, but now they'd have it one additional copy uh, on one of their alleles, or they could possibly have two alleles. And whether it was by part, uh, whether it was part of the gene movement itself, the gene duplication itself, or subsequent changes once this new gene landed at its new site, but it acquired an SS phenotype, a super stimulator. That is, it was not under environmental regulation. Okay, so then we can put that on our diagram by talking about the environment was regulating DMRT1. But then DMRT1 duplicated, we can just call it DMRT1B for the time being. So we have two separate copies, uh, and DMRT1B continued to positively regulate SOX, but was not regulated by the environment. So we can call that a DMRT1 super spreader, sorry, super, uh, super stimulator. And 
what we see is that now this single gene copy suffices to determine male development. And so this is what we call DMY. And we can see in the presence of DMY, SOX9 and FGF9 are stimulated, and we get the male regulatory program. In the absence of DMY, SOX9 and FGF9 are not stimulated, and we get the other regulatory program, the female regulatory program. Okay, so this is the way that DMY evolved. So this is slightly different than chicken. In chicken, we talked about a mutation giving rise to a difference in alleles at the initial DMRT1 gene. Here we're talking about a gene duplication that gave rise to a new copy of the DMRT1 gene, which we call DMY. Um, so if we think about, we sort of trace through what that would mean then. So here are our blue chromosomes where our new copy of DMRT1 landed. So we said it, it starts out only on certain alleles. Um, and what happens then is alleles that do not have the DMRT1 that set of alleles ends up giving rise to the Y to the X chromosome, whereas the super spreader gave rise to the Y chromosome. So, sorry, super stimulator. So while it, the the chromosome that this new gene landed on uh, over time gave rise to a Y chromosome, and in the other case gave rise to an X chromosome. So in fact, I'm telling you a little bit of, sto of a story right here because in fact this change in Madaka, this new DMY gene is so recent um, that there hasn't been wholesale changes in the chromosome as I've depicted here. But this is what we would expect um, if we were to come back in a time machine in a few million years. Okay, so we've talked about uh, Madaka, we've talked about environmental sensing in, tur in turtles, and we've talked about birds. So let's have a look at the, the two others. So again, I want to say completely independently, so try to erase from your mind the allelic and gene duplication complexity that we were just discussing. Let's talk about what evolved in mammals. So in mammals, what we see is SRY stimulating SOX9 to give this give rise um, to the male phenotype. So this one's a little bit more complicated to think through, uh, but we think that something like the following might have occurred. So here is a simplified circuit with just including SOX9 and FGF9. And so what we can see is there's a negative regulatory site here for Wnt. So it seems to be the case that in mammals, it's also the case that SOX9 positively regulates itself. And if we think about what effect we would expect that to have on the circuit, it's actually going to cause things to even be switchier, right? Because it's another form of positive regulation that SOX9 is directly positively regulating itself. Okay, so if we start from that point with this added little detail, um, now we can imagine a mutation, um, which is an, un, we'll call it UR for unregulated. That is a mutation in the Wnt binding site in a particular allele of SOX9. Uh, so when that occurs, if we just look at that allele, uh, we would expect this to change the regulatory program, right? It's no longer being negatively regulated by Wnt4. Uh, and so if we think about this in a diploid, so here I've just drawn you two SOX alleles, one that's unregulated and one that's wild type, um, and our FGF9 wild type gene. So this gets, starts to get a little bit ugly up here, um, but what I'd like to point out is that this SOX9 unregulated case, which is going to regulate, note that they're regulating each other because they're both SOX9 genes that have SOX9 binding sites, they're regulating themselves, um, and they're both regulating FGF9 as we'd expect. Basically all that's different here is that Wnt4 Wnt is regulating the wild type SOX, but not the other SOX. So if we think about it, and this is my, my key point here, I know that diagram was a lot to swallow, so please focus in on this. Um, this SOX9 unregulated state um, has what we expect or, or the key characteristic of SRY, um, which is to say that it positively regulates SOX9, but is not under negative regulation from Wnt4. So if this were the case, if we think about this diploid individual, this unregulated SOX9 copy is expected to stimulate the other SOX9 copy kicking off this loop, 
just as what we see in SRY. So basically what we're talking about is, is that this is the origins, or we think that this sort of change uh, are the origins of the SRY gene that is sex determining in mammals. And so that would mean that we saw that two changes happened. Um, the first is that uh, a wild type SOX9 mutated to give rise to uh, an, unregulated, uh, an unregulated allele, which we now call SRY, um, and that the chromosome that carried this SRY, those alleles gave rise over time to a Y chromosome. Well, what about the, the unmutated copy, right? Because we've said that this is going to give rise to a Y chromosome. Well, the partner here, the unmutated SOX9, then if, if this locus is giving rise to the, the Y chromosome, then that means this locus, the other alleles, are also going to give rise to the X chromosomes. So we can, we can look at that on our little chromosome diagram. So we start with two co wild type copies of SOX9. One of, a mutation occurs that gives rise to an unregulated copy. And then over time, we get a transformation um, with the wild type SOX9 staying on the X chromosome and the new allele, which we're calling SRY, um, being on the Y chromosome. And this is exactly what we see. SOX9 is on the X chromosome in mammals, and SRY is on the Y. Okay, so we just discussed SRY in mammals. Um, let's have a look at the last case, uh, which is DMW in frogs on the W chromosome. So here's the, the uh, circuit in frogs, and what we have is DMW negatively regulating DMRT1. So in females, they have a W chromosome, which shuts off this positive circuit and gives rise to the, the female regulatory program. So in this case, we, it was also a, a duplication and also of DMRT1, but I want to point out this is an independent duplication. These are two different evolutionary events. One happened in the ancestor um, of Madaka, uh, and now the other one occurred, occurred in the ancestor of, of frogs. And you can see that it's it's gone to a different chromosome at a different position. Instead of being on the blue pair, this one is on an allele of the orange pair. Um, so just as in the other case, um, we would initially expect that this gene uh, might positively regulate SOX9 but not be regulated by the environment. We're not really sure. And the reason we're not really sure is a lot changed. So this one is the hardest one to kind of guess about what happened. And so what we can say is that there was a duplication that occurred and then some time passed, some change occurred. And now this DMW, instead of positively regulating SOX9, it now negatively regulates DMRT1. And in preparing this, this video, I thought about different ways this could have occurred, but they all seemed um, so kind of hand wavy that I decided not to share them with you. We don't really know what happened in this case, but it's still notable that it is uh, a DMW is a copy of DMRT1 uh, that duplicated to another chromosome. And so if we think about what that would be then, then if we focus in on the orange chromosomes, um, that we have this new gene landing on one allele of these chromosomes, and then over time, giving rise to a transformed W and a transformed Z chromosome. Okay, so this take home on this, um, the sex determination in vertebrates used as a genetic switch. Different vertebrates flip that switch in different ways. New mechanisms of genetic sex determination can evolve when new copies of core genes in this switch arise. And importantly, that can arise either by gene duplication uh, or it can arise by mutation giving rise to new alleles. Um, and finally, that new sex determining alleles can give rise to new sex chromosomes.